if you were to ask me who my favourite all-time wrestler is, well, I've probably got a few answers depending on the day, but Eddie Guerrero would certainly be one of them. The man's in-win skills obviously don't need too much hyping up. He was a certified genius, as good at telling a story as he was technically proficient, someone who could build layer upon layer into his matches from the biggest strokes down to the finest details, and who could trap you into your seat with just the simplest, most graceful little movement. Eddie is legitimately one of the greatest to step foot into Lorin, and of course, he had the story too. His career certainly had its hills and valleys, whether it was due to frustration that came from being considered by certain decision makers as too small to reach the top of the mountain, or due to the personal troubles that came with both life on the road and the wear on his body. This video is, in many ways, about one of those valleys, and yet this valley was what set him on the way to reach the top. His time in the Indies, from late 2001 to early 2002, after being released from the WWF. Eddie's indie period, his time in exile if you will, consists of around about 30 or so matches, a lot of which are thankfully available to be watched. He wrestled all around the world during those six months, from the US and Canada to the United Kingdom and a brief stint in Japan, and it happens during a period of major change in the American indie scene which he will become a part of, wrestling several matches against people who would later become major stars, as well as taking the stage against old rivals and friends. It was a time when not only did he truly need to get right inside of himself, but that he, in his words, needed to get hungry again. And he most certainly did. As oversized a talent and presence as Eddie Guerrero might have been in the indie wrestling world of the early 2000s, he put in that work, as professional as ever, with the fire inside him gradually burning once more, even beyond getting the call to make his return to the newly christened WWE. It's a short period in the career of one of wrestling's greatest, but an incredibly important one, and so it's worth examining in detail. It's hardly a rise and fall, but more like a fall and rise. At the time when things started to really veer sideways for Eddie in June of 2001, he wasn't exactly at the top of the card, but was still being kept warm. His second European Championship reign ended on April 24th against Matt Hardy, and from there, in something of a twist of fate, <laughs> Eddie Guerrero ended up joining Team Extreme, where they would largely feud with the heel X Factor group throughout May. Still, this alliance was clearly somewhat uneasy. While Jeff was happy to have Eddie on board and somewhat oblivious to everything else, Matt was far more sceptical of Eddie's true intentions, and noticed that he and Lita, both his storyline and real-life girlfriend, were interacting more and more with each passing week. A May 31st six-man tag match really forced the issue. Team Extreme had the match won, but Matt couldn't help but notice that Lita was tending to Eddie on the outside after he'd just landed awkwardly from an over-the-top rope bump. This was enough for Albert to grab Matt off the top rope, hit the Baldo bomb, and win the match for the X Factor. While Eddie said in a shoot interview for RF Video later in the year that there wasn't too much of a long-term plan for this storyline, and they were essentially playing it by ear week on week, one presumes that something of a love triangle may have taken place. However, this match would be the last televised one of Eddie's first WWF run. On the next Monday's Raw, neither Eddie nor the events of last Thursday's Smackdown are referenced, not even when Matt and Jeff face each other in a Kin of the Ring qualifying match that Jeff would go on to win. It's only explained the week after, on June the 11th, when Jim Ross says on commentary that Eddie injured his knee after being thrown out of the win by Albert, and that he'd be out for the foreseeable future to take care of several issues. The truth of the matter, unfortunately, was that on the June the 4th war, Eddie turned up to the show in no fit condition to perform. He had struggled both with alcohol problems and painkiller issues that largely stemmed from the car accident he had on New Year's Eve 1998, and this was now coming to a head. The storyline changes were to cover up for him being sent to rehab at the Tolbolt's recovery campus in Atlanta, a decision largely taken by Jim Ross following a lengthy and often quite frank heart-to-heart -heart with Eddie. In 2005, JR was quoted as saying that they both cried that afternoon, that he told Eddie he loved him, and he did not want to call his wife to give her the news if anything happened to him. After spending four months in rehabilitation, the idea was to gradually bring Eddie Guerrero back to Lorin. 
Indeed, he would work a couple of dates in late October for WWF's Heartland Wrestling Association Developmental Territory, as well as two full-blown house shows at the start of November, defeating Funaki on both occasions. If this had gone well, then the indie one would have obviously never happened at all. But things aren't so simple, and with so much going on from the struggle to transition out of rehab and back into the real world, to the financial troubles he faced and the complete breakdown of his marriage, Eddie relapsed. On November the 9th he was arrested in Florida for driving while under the influence of alcohol and criminal damage, a charge he pleaded no contest to, ultimately receiving a probationary sentence. A couple of days after the charge, Eddie was released by the WWF. It was decided that Eddie had to lose something for Finns to truly change. As detailed by Bruce Pritchard in 2020 on his podcast, Eddie had to go away for a while in order to get better. Jim Ross handled the release, and John Laurinaitis made the phone call to Eddie. In 2022, Jim Ross described releasing Eddie as the single hardest release of his career. This was unquestionably a low point for Latino Heat. In his posthumously released autobiography, Cheating Death, Stealing Life, Eddie Guerrero described the humiliation of waking up in jail and the moment of being fired as what finally, truly, got him fully away from drinking. It was almost as if the release at least removed one thing from his mind, even if wrestling was all that he knew. Still, wrestling was the one way for him to get Eddie right, as he said. And almost as soon as Eddie's release was announced, he was getting calls from independent promoters, and he took his first booking for Impact Championship Wrestling, a New York-based outfit won by hardcore Jack Sabbath. He would wrestle an ICW World Title match against the promotion's champion, a then pretty hot young worker named Low Key. The initial idea was for the pair to wrestle out a draw, but Eddie had other ideas. Normally, said idea for someone who'd been up high in the rarefied airs that Eddie had been would include the phrase, Well, that doesn't work for me, brother, and wanting to win or otherwise make it screwy. But Eddie went the other way. He wanted enough time to wrestle the match his way where, at the end, he would put the young low key over. Even low key may have been somewhat shocked at that one. The ICW match against Loki is available online and is absolutely worth watching. It's an excellent affair in front of a pretty lively crowd. Eddie does indeed work a match in his way. It's one where Eddie and Loki trade a hell of a lot of fantastic match sequences, with Eddie showing a hell of a lot more than he'd had in his last couple of active months inside the Fed. Certainly there's a lot more fire in Lowe's eyes as he runs through the crispest of lucha sequences and amazing holds, executing the more physical moves with typical precision, including a vicious brain buster chain that you could, I suppose, call the two amigos. While Loki would go on to have a somewhat patchy career for his own reasons, he was absolutely one of the most white-hot acts in the indies back in the early 2000s, and he's a more than capable dance partner, reigning in his own predilection somewhat for endless stiff strikes. And then there's the crowd. With no commentary on the tape, we get to hear a lot of them. Eddie has nothing but positive words to say about the crowd at Elks Lodge in his book, but some people do give him a tough time. You may well hear the odd snarky comment, not to mention the chance of DWI. But it's the ending that comes as the big surprise. Eddie misses a frog splash, Loki goes up for a phoenix splash and Eddie rolls out of the way, but Key rolls out and recovers quickly. This quick recovery surprises Eddie, who is then caught with a roll up and pinned. Despite the heavy ovation at the start of this match, and the occasional snark during it, it's the ending that really pops the crowd. I doubt anyone in the audience truly expected Eddie Guerrero, in the more expected role of a former big star, to put Loki over clean like that, but put him over he did, and this match would set the scene for most of Eddie Guerrero's indie run. Eddie Guerrero's philosophy at this time was markedly different to a lot of once big stars who'd come into the indies. As he said in his book, he always believed that as long as you wrestled right and had a great match, you could still get yourself over while putting somebody else over. He didn't know at the time just how long he was going to be in the indies, or indeed if he was ever going to come out of them, but he was finding a passion for wrestling that he'd been missing for some time. If he felt like he'd had a bad match in front of an audience of about 25 people, 
He didn't just brush it off by thinking that it didn't matter because there weren't so many people out there. He was still annoyed if he felt he hadn't given his best, no matter who was out there. When he recorded his shoot interview for RF Video in December of 2001, he blamed no one else but himself for his current position and had no excuses, thinking that was what had to happen for him to recover himself, get back in touch with his own spirituality, Eddie was a very faithful person, and to feel a peace that he hadn't had in a long time. It's unfortunate that it takes these bad things in my life to get back to where I am, and spiritually, but I... I haven't had this kind of peace in a long time. Following on from the low-key match, Eddie would make a return to the Elks Lodge in New York on January 11, 2002, this time working for Frank Goodman's USA Pro Wrestling, against another former WWF and WCW worker, Devon Storm. We get another very fine little match here, with lots of Eddie's usual superb work, and Storm, most certainly a steady hand, handing with the technical side, and also pulling off some impressive stuff of his own, and there were certainly no chance of DWI this time around from the crowd. Eddie wins this one after Devon fails to cheat properly against the master. He tries to use a chair, gets caught out, eats a tornado DDT onto it, and then Eddie caps off the win with the frog splash. A smaller match against a wrestler named Mike Thunder, taking place for the Elite Wrestling Federation in Houston, is again typical of Eddie's work here. Another back and forth 15 or so minute match, only this time Thunder goes over after a blockbuster. Honestly, little seems to exist with regards to Mike Thunder beyond indications that he was a regular for the NWA and was only active for six years, which certainly makes this quite the outsized victory but that's the sort of thing that Latino Heat was all about, as long as he was given the conditions for it. This period also saw Eddie appear on a couple of televised events, albeit mostly in other countries. We'll get to his brief time back in Japan later, but for now let's go to the UK and a little show called Revival The King of England. This show from Mark Sloan's Frontier Wrestling Alliance marked a recent spurt in young British wrestling talent and was broadcast on the UK cable channel Bravo, with Eddie Guerrero also taking part. After beating Scott Parker in the quarters, he'd take on the anarchist Doug Williams in the semis. Williams is someone else who'd go on to have a pretty fine career, and this is a really good, speedy match with Eddie. It's almost entirely technical and based on the mat, feeling something like an evolution of the classic world of sports style, and Eddie's more than up for that, even throwing in some British style holds of his own. On this night though, Williams got the win for the home team. After Eddie manages a quick recovery from missing a frog splash, he's able to reverse Williams' Revolution DDT finish. However, Doug reverses a Lama Hestral attempt, blocking Eddie and pinning him. Fine little match this one. From my memory, the whole show's not bad, if you can find it. On the subject of things that are perhaps less good, Eddie also featured on the Australian-based World Wrestling All-Stars second show, The Revolution, on 24 February 2002, which was their only pay-per-view from the US. Here he has a triple threat against two guys he's unquestionably a lot more familiar with, Juventud Guerrera and the short-lived promotion's international cruiserweight champion, Psychosis. This match unfortunately takes place in front of a rather heatless crowd in Las Vegas, but the trio put on the good showing you would expect considering how often they've all shared the ring with each other. Interestingly, it sets something up that wouldn't be followed up on. Eddie actually wins the title after blocking a top rope Rana from Psychosis and following up with the Fog Splash, and his victory and promo ends up winning out Jerry Lynn, who was making his own in-win return following a release from the WWE. The two jaw jack and then start fighting, with Lynn getting the better of Eddie after a belt shot and hitting the cradle pile driver on said title, obviously setting up the pair for the next show. An Eddie Guerrero and Jerry Lynn match and feud would have surely produced quality, but of course it never materialised. By the time WWA held their third pay-per-view, April 12th's eruption, Eddie Guerrero's indie period was over. Still, this one match is at least a positive from a promotion that was generally somewhat of a late WCW-esque mess. Finally, on the subject of televised fins, Eddie did do a couple of spots for the IWA in Puerto Rico. He wrestled a match there against Super Crazy, which sadly I couldn't quite find, although we will be seeing more of this pairing a little later on. 
So when it comes to Eddie Guerrero's indie period, there's two promotions that really stick out over all the others, Ring of Honor and IWA Mid-South. These are probably where the most high profile and remembered matches of this period take place after all. Here we have a young opponent who's very well suited for him, and a crucial role at the very beginning of one of the highest profile indie promotions of them all. The ROH side of things is what starts off first, so we'll go there. Plans for the founding of Ring of Honor had been worked on since late 2001, when original parent company RF Video needed something to replace the revenue they'd previously earned from old ECW shows, and founder Rob Feinstein decided to start his own Philadelphia-based promotion featuring some of the hottest indie talents around. Eddie Guerrero would feature on their first show on February 23rd with a match that had actually been kind of set up on the shoot interview he'd done with RF Video in late 2001. He said that he'd like to face Super Crazy and said match was booked for the first show in collaboration with IWA Puerto Rico, with the winner becoming the new IWA Intercontinental Champion. The resulting match between Eddie and Super Crazy was one of the highlights of ROH's first show, a great contest pitting Eddie's wiles against the agility of the insane luchador. There's some particularly great moments. Eddie's brainbuster is, for me, one of the single greatest looking moves in wrestling history, and not only does he chain two of them together, another proto Free Amigos minus one, he also executes one on the floor, which is thoroughly nasty looking. Super Crazy, a pretty damn good worker in his own right, also produces some very exciting stuff, and we're helped along by a really hot crowd, especially seeing as both Eddie and Super Crazy have a lot of history and love in Philly for what they did just down the road from the Murphy Recreation Centre. You know, ECW. The finish here is quite similar to the earlier match with Doug Williams. Eddie goes up for the frog splash, rolls out when Crazy moves, and then tries to catch him with a tilt roll backbreaker, but Crazy reverses it into a small package and gets the surprise pin. Big celebrations, as well as a show of respect between the pair afterwards, as you generally expect in the world of early Ring of Honor. This first show is also notable for a promo from the man himself. He does a lot of hyping up of ROH and what they're trying to do here, but quietly this is one of the best promos of Eddie's entire career, especially when he talks about how he needs to get hungry again. We'll be getting back to ROH soon, but for now we're going to IWA Mid-South, which, it should be said, has no real relation to the previously mentioned outfit from Puerto Rico. IWA MS may possibly be where the most important moments of Eddie's indie period take place. Not only do we have a little cameo role from another legend who's spending a little bit of time in the indies, but we have someone who ended up having a pretty cool little mini storyline with Latino Heat, that being one Phil Brooks, or, you know, CM Punk. The storyline between this pair, a young mouthy pretender, and the man who was once near the top of the mountain, may have largely only lasted one weekend, but they'd sure fit a lot in there. On March the 1st Saturday show in Indianapolis, CM Punk, then the IWA champ, would defend his title in a packed triple threat where not only is he facing Eddie Guerrero, he's also facing Rey Mysterio Jr. After the end of WCW, Ray did a couple of Mexico tours, mainly in CMLL but also AAA, and then followed that up with a few indie dates in the first half of 02, with this by far being the most high profile. Essentially, a lot of it was getting back into gear and getting ready for his own arrival to the WWE, who he had been talking to. Ray is also still unmasked here, having not yet got the approval he felt he needed to put his mask back on after losing it in WCW, although he has started wearing the funky contacts. Meanwhile, Eddie apparently said to Punk and Ray that he wasn't a big fan of triple threats, and so largely trusted them to put the match together. No big deal for Ray, perhaps, but all this would be quite formative for Punk. In his own words, he said that he thought he was pretty damn good at wrestling until this night when he got in the ring with Eddie and Ray and they just, well, they did their thing. Punk knew pretty quickly that he still had a ways to go to hand with these two, and has commented a lot on the whole experience of working with Guerrero, including repeatedly calling him the greatest ever. On a personal level, Eddie would actually bond a decent bit with Punk during his indie time, something he talks about in his autobiography. As far as this pretty cool match goes, and as much as it's really quite surreal to see these three guys in an IWA Mid-South win, Eddie and Ray in particular, 
It's a very fun thing to see where Punk shows an awful lot of his potential, Ray's already started deploying the 619 and almost gets the pin on Punk to win the title, however he falls victim to classic old Eddie cunning. Eddie and Ray do the old filthy animals assisted Rana on Punk, but then Eddie immediately tosses Ray from the ring. He hits the frog splash, goes for the free, and Ray can't make it back in time. New champion! Eddie's got another belt from his indie journey, achieved by being just that little bit sneakier. The next night in Illinois, Mysterio goes to a 15 minute draw with Ace Steel and following this, as he's making his way back, he bumps into Eddie making his way into the ring with his title. All seems okay at first, but then Eddie does a sneak attack and starts beating on Mysterio. Old rivalries never quite die, do they? This serves to get some heat on Eddie and get the crowd roaring for CM Punk when he comes in to make the save and kick off the title match between the two. Of course, Punk being face makes a lot of sense seeing as we're so close to Chicago. With Eddie being the champ and working heel in this match, he naturally gets the great majority of the offence. Almost every part of the match sees Eddie lording it over the much less experienced Punk and shutting down every single comeback that he tries to attempt, either through cheating or just through being superior. It's a fine match, the crowd certainly gets on Eddie's back, and it does finally end with the fans going home happy. Rey Mysterio comes back to try and stop Eddie from using a chair, and when he gets into an argument with the ref, he surreptitiously slides said chair into the ring. Punk makes a crucial reversal, nails a British Fall DDT onto the chair, and that's enough for the free count. Punk regains the IWA Heavyweight Championship after 24 hours, and Rey chases Eddie off. Certainly a nice match to see, with Eddie getting a chance to work as the major heel against an underdog, and again, all of this would prove to be very important when it came not just to Punk's career, but to Eddie's as well. As mentioned, WWE and Rey Mysterio started talking in March. The company were looking to Rey as someone to head up the now Smackdown exclusive Cruiserweight division, and it seemed like Rey's signing wasn't really a question of if, but when. Around the same time, there was also a lot of word from the dirt sheets that Eddie's performances on the indie scene were very much attracting the WWE's attention. He'd had nothing but rave reviews for his technical performances, of course, but he'd also had many positive notes for the effect that he had on locker rooms, how he was using his experience to help others, and perhaps most importantly, how he'd changed and now had his life under control, reports such as Lowe's coming from those who knew Eddie more personally. The tons, it must be said, were very much beginning to wag. For now, Eddie had a set of dates on the other side of the world. He'd been in touch with his old friend, Victor Manuel, aka the Black Cat, and had agreed to do an 11 date tour in New Japan that would last the rest of March. Of course, this is far from Eddie's first rodeo with the company. He'd wrestled there for four years as the Black Tiger from 1992 to 96, although this would be his first time in New Japan without a mask. According to his autobiography, just before embarking on his tour, Eddie got a call from a rather familiar gravelly voice, a person who dealt with talent relations. John Laurinaitis had talked to Eddie a few times since his release from the Fed, and he'd now had word that Eddie was going on a New Japan tour. Essentially, the gist of the call was telling Eddie not to sign anything, and that the WWE were thinking of bringing him back, news which was, well, certainly welcoming to a point. The tour in New Japan was certainly productive. Eddie largely wrestled with Team 2000, mainly Jado, Gedo, Koji Kanemoto and the then current Black Tiger, Silver Kin, against guys such as El Samurai, Jushin Liger, Katsuyori Shibata, Masayuki Nause and Wataro Inoue. Some familiar names, of course, some newer ones. Of the matches on this tour, the most important one perhaps is a tag where Wataru Inui managed to get a pin on Eddie, something that New Japan tried to position as a sort of passing of a junior torch, seeing as how they probably realised quickly that they'd only have him for this one tour. On Eddie's side of things, doing this tour was important when it came to having that consistency and trying to get road ready for a possible return to the WWE schedule, although he also said in his autobiography that he wasn't too happy on the tour simply because he was so far away from home, and that this Japan tour was the closest that he came to relapsing once more. Still, when he finished it up and came back to the States, it was about time to set the wheels in motion. 
There are some other matches from this whole period that I've yet to mention, a couple of which are also available on YouTube. Eddie did a date for Nova's short-lived Phoenix Championship Wrestling promotion in February of 2002 against Nova himself. The pair went around 20 minutes in another very solid match, with Eddie winning and heavily putting Nova over after the bout. Nova himself was also going to be on his way to WWE soon, and the pair would actually face off again later in the year in Eddie's only appearance on Developmental Territory Ohio Valley Wrestling's TV show. There's also a match from another PCW, this time Premier Championship Wrestling, a Winnipeg-based promotion, where he defeated Playboy Will Damon in the main event. This is the typically good Eddie match from the indies, although it's worth noting that a then 18-year-old wrestler by the name of Kenny Omega was also on the card that night, in the curtain jerker against Mentallo, one of his trainers. Of these miscellaneous matches, the one I'd really like to see happened on a February 17th freelance show called International Superstars of Wrestling Super Slam 2, a main event bout on a show filled with soon-to-be stars where Eddie Guerrero took on the fallen angel Christopher Daniels, who was already an indie veteran in 2002. I am pretty sure that this match would have been off the charts amazing, and I've tried my damnedest to find it, but alas, I've come up short. On April 1st, the first Monday Night Raw after the original WWE draft, Eddie Guerrero made his return. He came charging in following a match between Booker T and Intercontinental Champion Rob Van Dam, assaulting the champ and being described as one of war owner Ric Flair's first signings. A mere three weeks after his return to the WWE fold, Eddie would win the Intercontinental title from RVD at Backlash, kickstarting a return year that had said feud with RVD culminating in a fantastic ladder match, a very short-lived and awkward programme with Steve Austin, and of course, the whole SmackDown 6 period, teaming with Chavo and having fabulous matches week on week, with a feud against Edge being a particular highlight. When Eddie signed back to WWE, he wasn't on anywhere near the same money at first as he was on when he originally signed back in 2000, but all this would work out if Eddie proved that he was well and truly back in business and giving his best, which of course he was. Still, when he signed back, he did have a couple more indie dates on his schedule, and happily, Eddie would do the professional thing and finish up his business. The first of these last three indie dates happens in IWA Mid-South, another triple threat on April 19th, with Eddie facing off against old rival CM Punk, as well as Colt Cabana. Once again, the IWA Mid-South title is on the line, still held by Punk after his victory against Latino Heat the previous month. This is... it's one of the weaker matches here, to be honest. Again, Eddie's not a huge fan of triple threats, and it really doesn't help that this match seems to take place in front of about 25 people in a gym in Dayton, Ohio. Not to say that the three guys aren't giving it their all here, of course, it's just hard for them to get any reaction. Lord only knows why this wasn't promoted any better. After the match, which Cabana wins following a small package on Punk, Eddie even gets into it with someone in the crowd who, well possibly has the stupidest early 2000s new metal of hair I have ever seen. Looks like a bloody bush in winter. Anyway, promoter Ian Rotten does come out to personally thank Eddie and say how proud he is to be able to say that Eddie Guerrero wrestled for him, which is nice, and Eddie thanks everybody who came tonight, even the asshole with twigs in his hair. I kind of wonder though if this is that one indie match Eddie talks about in his book, where he's pissed off about a match that was, quote, the drizzling shits, in front of 25 people, he was throwing around chairs and cursing, and realising that even if there were so few people in the audience, he still gave a shit because he thought the match was bad. Maybe it was, he does seem rather pissed off at the end, although maybe that was just to do with Twiggy over there. There's something that sounds a whole lot better, that puts a much smoother tie on Eddie Guerrero vs CM Punk. A match on April 26th for the Pennsylvania-based International Wrestling Cartel. Annoyingly, I haven't been able to find this one, although Punk himself described it in a 2021 interview prior to his return match in AEW. In this last match, the pair went 30 minutes, all the way to a draw, with Punk trying to hang on as best as he could with Eddie, who he quite simply described as a machine. At this point in time, Eddie was already, once again, the Intercontinental Champ. Following the draw, Eddie, totally unplanned, got on the mic and wanted five more minutes with said icy title on the line, just to know if he could beat Punk. 
Those five minutes happened, and Eddie ultimately won with the frog splash. And naturally, Punk was absolutely giddy about all of this, feeling like a kid who loves pro wrestling all over again. This also sounds very awesome, of course, but unfortunately I can't find any recording of this match, which is a bummer. Hopefully it exists somewhere. And now we come to Eddie's final indie match, April 27th on Win of Honor's third show, one called Night of Appreciation. This last match is a tag featuring three of the hottest and most athletic young Latin American wrestlers around. Eddie Guerrero teams with the Amazing Red against Jose and Joel Maximo, the Spanish announce team. Red and the SATs going against each other has already been a highlight of the early ROH cards, and these three wrestlers are precisely the guys that Eddie wants to put over on his last night in the Indies. This last match is a whole lot of fun, very hot, features plenty of the high-flying action you'd come to expect from the SATs and Red, still looks good now, and Eddie bossing it in the ring. The SATs do get a fair bit of heat on him, and even almost get him up for the Spanish fly, only for Red to intervene, but eventually Eddie's left in there with Jose. The finish is kind of a play on what we've seen for previous Eddie Indy finishes. After he and Red hit the filthy animal Zwana, Eddie goes for the frog splash and rolls out when Jose moves, but this time Eddie's able to counter again and he breaks out the old black tiger bomb to pin Jose and win the match. Just before the celebrations truly begin, there's one other little thing. Brian Excel, Red's old tag partner, comes out to challenge Eddie, which he duly accepts for right now. Brian tries to surprise Eddie with punches but is quickly overcome, powerbombed, brain busted, and after just 30 seconds or so, one final fog splash brings Eddie's time in the Indies to a close. Post-match is a suitably emotional affair. Lots of chants from the crowd, the whole of the ROH locker room coming out to applaud Eddie, and a speech from the man himself, talking about how being in this win makes him happy, how the boys in the back are his brothers, and the fans are family when they're watching, and finally having a proper embrace with the SATs and Red at the close of the show. Later on, Eddie Guerrero would describe this night as one of his favourites ever in a pro wrestling ring, and it's a fine way for him to finish up on the indies. This whole period may not be the most famous one in his career, but it was undoubtedly one of the most crucial. This was where Eddie started again and pushed his way back up from his lowest point. Without this time in the indies? Well, it's hard to say what would have happened. Even if, tragically, we didn't have anywhere near as much time to experience and love Eddie Guerrero in his lifetime as any of us would have hoped to have, it was this period that helped him start a journey that would lead all the way to the very top. The matches themselves are definitely worth checking out, and the story itself is special. One of the true greats came through the mire, remembered who he was, and became stronger than ever. He got hungry again. Bye for now.